That's a sheeted roof. Last nail, last board. Not watertight yet, but the sheeting's on. So a typical way of, of uh, waterproofing a roof in the time period we portray would be simply board and batten. But, uh, so I've got that on my primitive shelter. I've put it on my woodshed and uh, I put it on outhouse. I put it on food cache. Um, and why they did that, the wood was a readily available thing. If they had one thing in the new world, it was lots of wood and good quality wood. So at the time period, if we go back to Europe, um, 1600s, 1700s, roofs were either thatch or tile. So making uh, roofs out of wood was a novel idea. I, I can't use this method on the new blacksmith shop because my boards run the opposite way due to the type of construction I did. So ultimately I'm going to shingle it like I did the cabin with cedar shakes. So the cabin, we made uh, quite a few of the shakes from our own material. We ended up buying some because We've got thousands of cedars on our property, but uh, we don't have a lot of clear grain ones, the quality that one needs to make the shakes from. So uh, I'm going to cheat a little on the blacksmith shop. I'm going to leap into the 21st century. I'm going to temporarily cover it with a, just a graveled uh, tar paper to get it sealed in so I can get the forge built and I can start banging steel this winter. And then in the spring, we'll, we'll uh, get at putting a proper historically accurate uh, cedar shake roof on it. There you go. That's the last nail in the sign. Um, I painted that, that sign. That was a fun project and I'm definitely no Rembrandt, but uh, uh, I'm quite pleased with the way it turned out. And dur during the build, I've got all kinds of scrap left over from my pine planking. Uh, for structural integrity in the roof, I didn't want all my joints meeting, so I did a lot of cuts to sort of spread them about. And uh, I'll be able to make a whole lot more of these um, bird nesting boxes. Uh, we've got 70 some odd in the wood lot and I think I've got uh, a rough estimate I got enough wood to make about 70 more. So good for the birds. So uh, a wee bit of history about signs. Um, we know that signs date back to approximately 3000 BC. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans and th they were essentially symbols. Uh, people were illiterate so they were carved in stone. And um, if the, in more elaborate uh, organizations, say the Greek bathhouses, they would use materials like bronze or copper or even marble to show them. And then we can fast forward to the 13th century. So the period following the Dark Ages. And there's this huge economic recovery, if you would. And so the gifted craftsmen started to even though they were still using symbols, obviously, they started to use things like a, a symbol that would stand out to people, uh, a unique symbol. Uh, so we think of it today as a brand, and, and, and I'll, I'll let you ponder that, but that started a long time ago. And then we fast forward again to the 17th century, and signage now, there's, for example, in England, a law is passed, uh, and it's dictating that um, so it, signs ought to uh, reflect what the uh, shop or business is, uh, is, is selling. So, so they became law in England. But again, they're still symbols because a lot of people co couldn't read or write. And you think about symbols like the, the tankard on the tavern sign here, or on my blacksmith shop, I painted an anvil. So those would tell the person what they could expect. So even Friar Tuck knew if he, if he crossed the threshold of this cabin, he, he knew what to expect once he got inside. So now we get into the 18th century and a lot more people are literate. So signs often at that point would reflect both a symbol and a script. And uh, anyway, it, it, it's been fun building them. Um, I don't think I got any more <laughs> buildings to build, so I'm probably no more signs, but uh, it was a fun project. And uh, yeah, now I'm gonna get back at that blacksmith shop because I'm really anxious to start banging some hot steel. Uh, almost forgot. Uh, just to finish my story on the history of signs, um, we're going to go into relatively modern time period. So uh, in 1880, um, 
no, sorry, 1840, the first gas sign is made and it, it, it illuminates a sign for the P.T. Barnum Museum in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, it can run for five hours, a full five hours before it needed recharging. We go for, uh, forward a wee bit more and we get into 1881 and the first sign is actually illuminated by an incandescent light bulb. And it's simply stamped Edison. And in 1882, that light bulb makes its way to the International Electrical Symposium, or exposition, I should say. Uh, now we're almost there. <laughs> we're almost to modern LED lights, if you would. But prior to that, this fellow named uh, George Cl Cloud, 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 something like that, Clout, perhaps. In uh, 1900, he discovers uh, uh, neon gas. And by 1910, he's, he's developed the neon tube. And then he gets this bright idea. He says, maybe I could take that tube by heating it, and I could bend it into the shape of letters or symbols. And we have what we know today as the, as the modern neon sign, and they're still being used today. Anyway, I digress. I, I got work to do. So just before I finish my sign, um, a couple more wee bits of history. And, and these are from followers that follow our channel that share their stories and I find them amazing. So one fellow from Southwestern Ontario wrote to me saying that I had an uncle that was a, a blacksmith, a farrier and a minister. And now a blacksmith and a farrier, sometimes they were both, but more often than not, Blacksmith did the finer stuff, um, the our craftier things, the things that were harder. And a smith, um, or a farrier, I should say, if he used a, a blacksmith shop, it would be simply for making these guys horseshoes. So <laughs> I'm trying to visualize the sign this this uncle of this fellow would have had. So he would need a he'd need a cross, he'd need a horseshoe, and he'd need a uh, an anvil to demonstrate that he was all of those three. And and so I guess come Sunday, it would say farrier blacksmith off duty when services were on or something like that. But, and then another story, and this would be one, this, this story was sent from a fellow from Manchester, England. And, and uh, he had a great, great grandfather who, who was a, uh, a well-respected hangman, so he says. Now, I don't think he had a sign. <laughs> Or if he, if he did, I can't quite imagine what would be on it. But uh, he was telling me that uh, he was respected because if someone was on uh, slated to be hung, uh, this is a grim topic. I'm not trying to make humor of it. But if someone was on it, they wanted this guy because he did, apparently there's formulas. They did a little research. So they take the height of a person, the weight of the person, and they calculate the amount of drop and all that stuff. Well, he'd fine tune the gallows. So the, the death was quick and clean. Anyway, um, uh, reportedly as a street named after in Manchester, England. Anyway, I, I won't mention that fellow's name. I'll just, I guess he's proper English, so I'll just call him a chap, sent me that one. Anyway, I love building, but the highlight for me is, is reading these stories that people send in. These are personal, they're family history. And uh, yeah, we, you know, I fi find history fascinating, all forms of history, but we're making history every day. And even getting some of these modern bits of history, I find absolutely amazing. All right, I'm gonna finish up my sign. And I think I like it there.